So <clears throat> welcome everybody. Um, my name is Jackie Hayden. I am president of the Academy of Medical Educators and I'm really pleased that so many people are joining us this evening to the fourth of our insight series. Um, we our insight series, we are taking topics uh, of interest to uh, a wide variety of people. There are a series of webinars and panel discussions. And so far, we have covered uh, a, an evening on interprofessional education. Uh, we have also um, considered reflective learning for medical educators. And we are in the future uh, working on sessions on reverse mentoring and embracing neurodiversity in our healthcare educators. So I hope that you will, you will keep an eye open for uh, new um, activity in our website. So just a little bit about the Academy and uh, to welcome you to, I hope will, will be a really interesting evening. I believe that many of you have not yet ventured into the Academy. And if you haven't, perhaps this evening will inspire you to have a look at our website and consider whether you'd like to join us. We, we currently have three levels um, that you can join, actually four if you count student membership. So we have an associate membership, um, which you can just join or you can measure yourself against our standards, either to enter as a member or as a fellow. So our academy was established in 2006. It's a charitable organization and it's here to advance uh, medical education for the benefit of the public. It's a professional organization for all those involved in education and training and uh, particularly for doctors, physicians associates, dentists, and uh, veterinary scientists. The Academy is the standard setting body for medical educators in the UK and our standards, which you can see the front cover of there and also uh, the five domains and the core values, um, are our touchstone and it is through those that we try and improve the quality of training and we assess individuals uh, to join us as members and fellows of the academy. We have over 1200 members across the UK and globally who benefit from access to a network of medical educators at every level of career progression. We have regular newsletters, we have mailings and updates via the online community and a program of academic meetings. And at this point, I want to in particular play thanks to Claire Stocker and to Tony um, Carlisle and the team, Jody and Paul, for all that they do to make sure that these events all run and they're very high quality. So if you get the opportunity, join us next week at our annual Kalman lecture, which is taking place online. Sorry, did I say next week? I mean tomorrow, taking place online. And for the first time, we have a speaker who is responsible for dental education. So moving to tonight, I'm delighted that Alison Bullock, who is a long-standing fellow of the Academy and a great support uh, to us and to me in particular, is going to be chairing the panel discussion. Alison is Professor of Medical and Dental Education at Cardiff University School of Science, Social Science and Dental Education at Cardiff University. And she has been there since 2009, and she's director of the <clears throat> Cardiff Unit for Research and Evaluation in Medical and Dental Education. 
The purpose of the UNIT and Allison's main activity is to conduct multidisciplinary research and evaluation of the education and training of healthcare professionals. She has accumulated over 100 peer reviewed publications and until recently was associate editor of the European Journal of Dental Education. She is currently the director of research for the School of Social Sciences. The Academy is also extremely grateful to the four professionals that are making up our panel tonight. These are Professor Andrew Dickinson, who is the post, I think actually that's, he's now Chief Dental Officer. Kirsty Moons, who is uh, from Health Education and Improvement Wales. And uh, to Jane Luca, who is the Dental Postgraduate Dean in Health Education Southwest and Chair of English Dental Deans and Chair of Copdent. And last but not least, Paul Wilson, who is the Clinical Lecturer in Restorative Dentistry at Cardiff University. Alison, I'm going to hand over to you now uh, to perhaps say a, a little bit more about our panel and to introduce us to the evening and then at the end of the evening I'll say a little bit more about upcoming events. Thank you very much Jackie and a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm really excited about tonight's programme. Uh, I want to say that in planning this meeting really was our intention to bring together speakers from policy and practice and research able to offer a range of perspectives really across the continuum of education from undergraduate, postgraduate and through into lifelong learning. And honestly, what a treat of a programme we have in store for you this evening. Um, I am really delighted with our speakers today. They are so experienced, super experienced and really well equipped to speak on array of current challenges facing dental education and looking to the future. I'm confident that the insights that they'll share with you this evening are relevant to educators across the healthcare settings, not just dental education. The programme will be information rich and there will be opportunities for the people here present, the delegates, to um, raise questions and we'll get some responses from our speakers. And as uh, somebody joining the, the presentation tonight, I understand that you'll be able to have access to the speaker's slides. But before we get underway, I just briefly wanted to say a little bit more about our esteemed speakers. Um, Professor Andrew Dickinson is, as, as Jackie was saying there, is our recently, fairly recently appointed Chief Dental Officer for Wales. And in that role, he advises ministers, provides that leadership for the profession, which includes addressing some of the really challenging work, workforce planning issues and quality matters, promoting dental health for the population of Wales. He was formerly the um, regional postgraduate dean for Midlands and East of England and um, is of note for some people here. He's dual, dual qualified dentistry and medicine and uh, oral and maxillofacial surgeon. Andrew has also served as the vice chair of COPDEND and COPDEND is the committee of postgraduate dental deans and directors. It's a UK committee. Few words about Andrew that was. Uh, a few words about Dr Jane Luca who is the Acting Medical Director for University Hospitals, the Bristol NHS Foundation Trust. She qualified in King's College London and worked in various house officers, senior house officer and registrar posts in London and Leeds and Bristol where she completed her PhD in oral pathology. Uh, Jane was appointed a consultant in dental and maxillary radiology at University Hospital Bristol NHS Trust in 2000, where she has for many years, she was the clinical director for dental services. She was appointed deputy medical director in 2008 and is a specialty advisor for the Royal College of Surgeons and secretary to the Association of British Dental Hospitals and Schools. What an impressive programme. 
Kirsty, Kirsty Moons is adding to our impressive programme as the postgraduate dental dean for Wales based in Health Education and Improvement Wales, which works closely with Welsh Government. So she's long contributed to the work of the General Dental Council as a council member, where she's chaired the Policy and Research Board. Kirsty has worked in dentistry in Wales her whole career since qualifying as a dental nurse in 1990, I believe. She's a long track record of working in dental education, where she's concerned with the education and training of all members of the diverse dental team. And our fourth esteemed speaker is Dr Paul Wilson, who's been a clinical lecturer here at Cardiff University School of Dentistry since 2017, and he's the Year 5 lead and has a special interest in minimal intervention dentistry and cariology. He gained his um, BDS from University of Bristol in 2010 and did his foundation, dental foundation training in the Southwest Deanery and then worked for 12 years in general dental practices, mainly within the NHS and including areas serving high need, high deprivation. He's an examiner for the uh, membership of the Faculty of Dental Surgery and an associate of the Chartered Institute of Educational Assessors. Wow, I'm impressed. Um, I'm going to ask each of them to speak for about 15 minutes and to give their insights on the future of dental education and, and the issues facing the, the world of dental education. I'd like to encourage you to ask questions by typing them into the Q&A box. Now, if your screen is like my screen, if you hover over the bottom of the screen, you will see uh, a Q&A um, button with a couple of like speech bubbles. So that's the, that's the thing to use to pop in your questions. Um, then I and some of the Academy colleagues will monitor those questions and we'll be able to put them to the panelists on your behalf. If you use the Zoom chat, be aware that um, we won't be able to read out all of the chat. And the best option, I think, is to use the Q&A box, as I've indicated there. So that's our four speakers. We'll have our four speakers. There will be a short break and then we'll come back for the panel discussion. It's a packed programme. You've not come to listen to me. So I think without further ado, I want to welcome to our stage, our first speaker, Dr. Paul Wilson, please. Thank you very much, Alison. Thank you for a very kind um, introduction and thank you for inviting me here today. So let me just share my screen and hopefully you can see that now. Um, so I wanted to talk about the future of dental education from an undergraduate perspective, undergraduate education perspective. And um, for those in the audience who are unfamiliar with the world of dental education, there are 16 uh, dental schools in the UK, uh, as far as I can count, uh, spread fa fairly evenly across the country. Um, but in Wales, there is only one dental school here in Cardiff. Um, so we have a particular duty to the Welsh nation in our training. Uh, at Cardiff University Dental School, we offer three undergraduate programmes. Uh, we offer a Bachelor of Dental Surgery, uh, a Diploma in Dental Hygiene and a BSc in Dental Therapy and Dental Hygiene. So let's talk about uh, some of the uh, problems that students are facing at the moment. So uh, our students have had a very disrupted education uh, and that's not just here at university but uh, for our younger cohorts uh, that's during their A-levels as well and we're starting to see that with with our, our younger years uh, these students have had less experience with things like assessments and face-to-face face-to-face teaching so this this is going to be a challenge for a number of years not you know the pandemic is over but the effects of that may well last us several years afterwards Student well-being and mental health has been a, a, a huge issue, uh, particularly since the uh, pandemic struck uh, and is continuing uh, at the moment. And, and universities have done an awful lot to try and help students uh, through these difficult times. Uh, 
Of course, at the moment, we have a cost of living crisis. And this is something that we as educators often don't feel comfortable speaking to our students about. Uh, but actually, um, some of our students are and will be going through very difficult times uh, this year and going forwards. Uh, and we need to be there to support them. Um, Online teaching, I mentioned this, uh, this is a particular curiosity that I found. Um, this academic year, there has been a seismic shift against uh, online teaching. And I'm aware of the irony that this meeting is online. Um, but suddenly, whereas students were previously reasonably happy to, to have online teaching or a sort of hybrid approach, um, students have turned. Uh, they, they do not like it at all. Um, and we know that through their engagement, we know that through their, their feedback to us. So we found that we've actually had to very quickly change a lot of our teaching back to face to face, um, which has been uh, quite a task recently. Uh, and of course, our students are facing reduced clinical experience. Um, and I'll be talking about that. Uh, well, let's talk about it now. So um, reduced clinical experience, this is an issue that is uh, an ongoing trend. Uh, it's around when I was at dental school, um, but has been particularly acute in the last few years since COVID. Um, and uh, why is this happening? Well, of course, we've got the changing needs of the population. So uh, people keeping their teeth for longer. Uh, so of course, students are gonna get less experience in things like dentures and tooth replacements. Um, but also we have uh, dentistry is changing. Minimal intervention dentistry means that we don't intervene as much in people's teeth as we used to. So in the past where someone might need a, a filling, nowadays we may be able to re remineralize that carious lesion and place fluoride or something else very simple, which means students get experience in management, but they don't necessarily get the hands-on practical experience that they, may use, that, that they used to. Uh, of course, since COVID, um, this has drastically reduced a dental school's capacity to see patients uh, and to give undergraduate students experience. And um, uh, we, we've been very lucky at Cardiff in that uh, because of our, our asbestos uh, building uh, seems to have mechanical ventilation. So uh, quite soon after the pandemic, we are able to start aerosol generating procedures um, and allow students to, to treat patients from 2020 onwards. Um, but other dental schools found that much more of a challenge. Um, and even though we could see patients still at a very much reduced capacity, uh, which we are returning to capacity now, but this is a, a, a massive issue. And then, of course, there's issues with um, referral pathways, um, which um, involves very close uh, sort of uh, coordination with our NHS colleagues. Um, at the moment, we're trying to uh, possibly develop um, referral pathways for single items of treatments, which may help to uh, sort of reduce waiting lists in primary care, um, get people out of pain and give our undergraduates the, 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 the treatment they need, for instance, root canals, things like that. Um, when the pandemic struck and we were facing this reduced experience, uh, we worked very closely with the General Dental Council um, to develop a system called the Individual Capability Portfolio. Uh, and this is a capability-based assessment tool which moves away from the uh, old quotas or totals so not just assessing the number of treatments that students uh, are, are doing uh, on their undergraduate degree, um, but um, actually getting them to uh, reflect uh, and to, to make those fewer experiences better learning experiences. Um, and this may involve su some simulated treatments as well. So obviously we want our, our students to uh, engage with uh, real patients, but where this is not possible um, or reduced in number, then simulated activities um, can be a part of this. This is something that we're planning to continue for the foreseeable future. Now, I want to talk about um, one of the, the big talking points in dentistry at the moment, which is uh, uh, working within the wider dental team. So we uh, at Cardiff uh, have the free undergraduate uh, programmes and in the past, these were somewhat integrated. Since COVID, they've become very much disintegrated because of capacity issues, timetabling, things like that. Um, but our plan is to have much greater integration between the, the, the free training programs that we have so that students aren't just delivered, uh, have teaching delivered together, uh, but actually work together on clinics as teams uh, from different courses, but also different years of different courses, each knowing their scope of practice, and getting experience referring to each other and treating patients as part of a team approach, like a modern dental practice. Of course, 
um, this involves uh, the wider dental team as well um, for our um, for, for these groups of people who we don't train but we work with very closely and then of course there's other groups of students our medic and pharmacy uh, friends um, and we're looking to develop uh, interprofessional education uh, which um, some of you may have attended the talk uh, a while ago um, from the academy uh, this is something very exciting that we're looking to uh, develop over the next couple of years so one of the big issues is staffing. So as with everywhere, there are issues with staff retention, staff well-being, workload issues, and problems with burnout. Um, so we need to be looking after our staff. Now, this is all me pontificating, but um, when I was thinking about, well, what is the future of dental education in an undergraduate world? Well, I decided to go to the undergraduate clinic and ask the future of dental education. And they told me we want staff to be consistent in their teaching. This was the number one issue that students told me at the moment. And this took me by surprise. I thought, well, you know, it's an issue, but it's not right up on my list. Um, but OK, that's top of their list. So what are we going to do about that? So consistency in teaching. I wanted to talk about caries management as, a, as an example. I do tend to go on about this far too much. I'll keep it brief. Um, but caries management is something that um, we all felt was, um, was an issue that could be developed and an issue where supervisors and clinicians and lecturers were giving students maybe slightly different advice. So we looked at developing our lecture programmes uh, and making sure that they tied in with the latest evidence and guidelines. Um, we then looked at integrating this new teaching into our preclinical training programme. So historically, students uh, practice drilling cavities on plastic teeth uh, in, in a lab environment before going on to patients. And these would be sort of average size cavities. But we want to bring in case-based learning so that students are getting real life experience of diagnosing caries, drawing up a treatment plan, and then providing the appropriate treatment, which, by the way, isn't always a filling. To ensure that uh, the uh, students, lecturers and supervisors are on the same page, we organised staff development days where we, we conducted training. Um, however, we found that um, many of our part time staff were unable to attend these events. Um, so we organised online CPD as well. We made sure that it was compliable with uh, verifiable CPD um, to, to give an incentive there for staff to, to engage. And we made sure that we publish good information which is easily accessible. So this ties in with what students' expectations of a dental education is. The students basically want all the information they need in order to pass exams. They want clear, concise rules that they can follow. They want face-to-face -face teaching. They want value for money. And why not? These students are paying three times more for their degree than I did. Uh, so they deserve value for money and they want to be listened to. Um, but this may differ from our uh, expectations as educators. We want students to be using their clinical judgment and critical thinking. We don't just want to tell them the answers all the time. We want them to work out the answers. Students can find this difficult. We want them to have a good knowledge base and to be clinically competent, but we also want them to be well-rounded individuals who can talk to their patients, who can work within a dental team. And we want them to be inspired for a career in dentistry. Of course, another key stakeholder is the university itself. The university, of course, wants their students to graduate and we want good student feedback uh, from the NSS and with TEF. Um, but of course, there are questions of what do we do with a failing student or an unprofessional student? These are big issues. And then there is the General Dental Council's expectations. Uh, G the GDC wants a safe beginner. They want a rounded professional. They want us to work within the dental team and ultimately to put patients' interests first. And these are laid down in the preparing for practice documents. Um, so we have all these key stakeholders and others as well, including the NHS uh, and other regulators and bodies. Um, so dental education really is a balance between um, all of these interests um, and hopefully we'll be steering a, a clear path to the future. So thank you very much um, and I look forward to hearing uh, about uh, from the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much Paul. That's a super kickoff and you've already raised a number of issues. I'm going to encourage people to um, pop their questions into the Q&A box and we will take questions after we've listened to each of our speakers.
So thank you very much, Paul. I'm going to hand over now to um, Kirsty. Kirsty would like to come in. Thanks, Alison. I will just share my screen. Thank you very much. I think Paul set that up really well. Is my screen shared? Not no. yet. Oh, it's just coming up. Yes. And now? Yep, super. Okay, smashing. So um, I'm just going to talk about um, team perspective. So I'm coming from a slightly different position um, than my colleagues. I come from the team. I've done some work with Alison over the years, researching into skill mix, and I felt it was quite opportune to come with my um, different perspective and talk about where the team fit, sits in some of the challenges we're facing at the moment. Um, and, and Paul has very well articulated some of the challenges we're facing. We've got workforce wellbeing morale. We know there's some real challenges there. We've got a workforce crisis, like much of the health service at the moment. Um, the pandemic exposed that the team had a lot of transferable skills. Many of them voted with their feet and left the profession. We've got a recruitment crisis, retention, means the existing workforce can't continue their education and, and develop. We've got workforce data is just notably absent for the dental team to inform planning in a meaningful sense, although we do our very best um, in the absence of that data. And work-life balance, we've got, we know that, that the, the, the chaps coming through the profession now want to work less hours, they want to portfolio careers, so that's reduced hours in the, in the workforce. We're seeing an increase in overseas graduates and overseas dentists, particularly registering and working as hygienists and therapists. And that's presenting some real challenges. It's growing the workforce, but some regulatory challenges in terms of international graduates registering, but then in terms of uh, in increasing to support them in, as well in the workplace, particularly in practices which are already struggling. Um, the mixed economy of dentistry, I think, it, I, and my colleagues will probably reference this as well as we go through the evening, um, is a challenge. Um, and, and the cosmetic dentistry and the Instagram dentistry, you know, let's not ignore it. It is, it is a real thing. So there's some real challenges in there. And Paul, Paul's articulated quite well some of those. Um, but we've had opportunities. Um, and there are opportunities. And I think one of the benefits of having the spotlight on dentistry is it means we are getting attention. And it's long overdue and, and, you know, we are in the perfect storm, but there are opportunities for change and taking things forward. And I think education lays the foundation for a lot of that system reform, contract reform. And I know Andrew will talk a bit more about some of these things. And so will Jane when they present. So I won't labour them. Skill mix opportunities we've talked about at length. Um, workforce planning. We need the data, but we can certainly plan, plan and start looking at what, what we, we know what needs to be done. We know what it, what it needs to look like. We know what good looks like. We know we've got problems. So we, we can start to plan for that. We need to increase the number of training places to improve, improve recruitment, but attraction into the professions. We need more flexible training options. We know that the, that the younger generations don't want to work full time in, 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 in you know, single handed practices forever. It's, they, they, their wants and their needs are different and their aspirations for careers are different. So we need to be meeting that and, and developing flexible options. And I know Jane and, and Andrew will, will reference some of this when they talk. So we have opportunities. Paul mentioned as well about going online and the hybrid learning and that's accelerated. You know, the pandemic, one of the benefits of the pandemic is it accelerated that offer considerably. So we've moved forward quite a bit, but there's still an awful lot of work to do um, to improve the position. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the workforce and what it looks like. And Paul did mention this, which I'm really grateful for, because quite often we talk about dentistry, we talk about dentists, and we forget that there is a whole team that is regulated by the General Dental Council that is statutorily registered. Um, that also contribute to patient care. And if we look at this, and these, these are GDC figures. So in terms of workforce data, we've got some real challenges. We don't know where this workforce is. We don't know where they're working. We don't know what they're doing. We don't know their scope of practice, the, the number of hours. We don't know the commitment to the NHS, private. There's, there's a whole host of challenges in terms of workforce data, but this is registrant data. What's really interesting here, and there's around 114, 115,000 altogether, but what, what's, what's, what I really want to draw out here is as far as the GDC is concerned, and generally the dental profession, this 60,000 60, of these roughly, the majority of registrants on the, on the register are what's classed as dental care professionals, DCPs we are called collectively. Now that's that's a, a not a useful term. It's a, we're not one homogenous group. DCPs are six quite distinct um, professions or roles as, as I will draw out as I go through the presentation but it's it's useful to highlight that because every one of these roles contributes to the care of patients in some way as we as we go along. Skill mix is a very interesting much debated um, 
and I will attribute some of this to Alison because we've worked together on this um, for, for some time. It's, you know, it, it means different things to different people. And there's a lot of different definitions for skill mix and what it means and how it works most effectively. And we've, we've done a fair bit of work in this space. Um, Sivalt particularly talked about role enhancement, role substitution and the different kinds of things that we can do. And I think one of the important things to articulate is it's not one thing. It's a fairly dynamic, iterative thing. But, it, but it, it's, it's growing across the NHS and across the healthcare system. Dentistry, I think, has been relatively slow. Um, there's been a lot of studies that talk about the benefits of skill mix, um, freeing up qualified staff, complex treatment, improves access, helps them serve populations. Paul talked about the, the, um, the need, um, the grow of the aging population and the need, and there's an emphasis on prevention. There is, there is absolute uh, merit in terms of skill mix in the health force and, and, and particularly in dentistry I think where the team is regulated by one regulator um, and there are opportunities to grow that. Um, the policy supports more flexible skill mix and I think both Jane and Andrew will reference this. The policy is quite clear there's been a number of reports I mean going back years Nuffield uh, did a report, report originally when I was early in my career the GDC has supported that still review there's been a number of different policies um, and reports, but dentistry is slow to develop compared to other areas of healthcare. And, and there are probably a, a number of reasons underneath that. And it's not for lack of trying. I think, you know, the, 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 the policymakers are, are clear about um, skill mix and the benefits of skill mix. I think there's some real fundamental challenges in there. And there are, you know, there's a number, the, the literature is quite clear that it's, it's, it's not the golden nugget that everybody thinks it might be. There are some challenges in there. But, but I think it's something that we have to build into the, the planning for education and training. Um, some of these problems were pulled out from some of the research, I need to see Alison's reference there, and th these are from dentists. These are some of the challenges that dentists drew out of why they weren't embracing skill mix. And you can see there's a common theme across there, the financial restraints. Um, yes, we can see they improve patients' oral health, but financially they don't work. Um, the contract, finance, and, and that's a common theme that came across all of the research is, is that they don't, they don't really, um, the, the bottom line. Now, and Andrew could talk about this, I know in Wales there's been a lot of work to done to, to, to try and reshape the contract to make it more prevention focused to increase the use of teams, um, making DCPs contribute to that. Um, there's some fundamental problems, and I have, to talk, I have to talk about this. Education and training for dental care professionals is very complex, much more complex than it should be. Um, dentists have quite established, well-established career pathways. You graduate as a dentist, you, um, you then go into foundation training, you can go into core training, you can go into specialty training. There's quite well-established career pathways. You can go and become an academic pathway or a clinical fellow. It's quite well-established, well-supported um, validated pathways there, there is there is nothing like that for any of the dental care professionals it's a very mixed bag limited progression opportunities um different employment models majority are employed by the independent sector or self-employed they work in isolation they don't have that collective professional voice which is a real challenge because there's six different roles um that then quite often not supported to expand their skills or, or work differently um value is a particular problem i think in in, in dental practices um, and the, and the, and the post-registration training is limited. It's up to them what they do. Um, it's often self-funded and, and it's, it's a real mixed bag of what's available. Uh, so pre and post-registration, quite difficult routes. And, and we're not talking about high levels. We're talking about, you know, there is a potential for, for a really good skills escalator in dentistry, really good skills escalator. You know, we, we can get people in early on and develop the careers. There's real challenges in that landscape in that it's a mixed bag of provision. The regulator demands different levels of, 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 of um, well, the GDC doesn't demand that actually. There, there, there's a real mixed bag of what they, they need to achieve to, to meet the registration. And HEIs, universities have different, they don't have contextual offers, the widening access. So 30 years ago, you could be a dental nurse and come in, and then you could, that would guarantee you entry into a, into a dental hygiene program. That door's closed because the, the, the universities now want high, high academic tariffs and the A-levels and et cetera. So there's some real challenges in building that skills escalator in and, and improving the offer um, and the foundations that would then allow people to develop career pathways. And that's just that's just your pre-registration qualification, qualifications. Beyond that, there's, there's even more challenges then of what they might do post-registration. 
there's a, there's a, there's a, and I'm going to be quite provocative here because I was told to be provocative. Um, and this, this is a really good quote, I thought. Professional protectionism or resistance can inhibit the development of new models. And, and, and ultimately, let's remember patients at the end of this journey. There are, this is all about patients and the best care for patients. This, this I think, is a great quote. And, and I, I, I am quite provocative here, and I will be quite honest. I do think the profession has not embraced skill mix. And I think the, the contract and all the reasons why I'm not sure even if those levers were put in place, they would still embrace it. I still think there's some fundamental problems. Dentistry does not, you know, I think there's some real challenges in dentistry as a collective, having a single voice and working working in, in the best interest of the patient for, for it as a team. Um, on, on, on a global basis, I'm talking now, on a, on a wider basis, not on an individual practice basis, but there's some real challenges in there. And I do think that professional protectionism still exists. And I will call it out, and it may be unconscious or conscious. But I've come across both, and I come across both frequently. Um, and I say this as a dental care professional. Uh, that unconscious bias runs deep within some. It is like a stick of rock. It is written through them, but it is there. And, and I think, you know, there is work to do in, in recognising that in ourselves um, and, and colleagues and calling it out and asking and challenging it. So I think there's some real challenges in there, but I call upon my colleagues and I know I've got fellow dental care professionals on this evening, which I'm delighted about. Um, I can call upon my colleagues, dentists and, you know, we need to work together collectively to improve things. Um, learning from others, there's a lot of work out there and, and there's a particular report that I, I was reading quite recently about GP practice and skill mix that's been published this year, supported by NHR, which, you know, says that there's some challenges, it's not perfect, one size doesn't fit all, um, but you know, directing patients to the appropriate practitioner is really important. What what surfaced in the research that they that they did in this report was that um, an unintended consequence was that the GPs had to pr provide more time supervising, and that was that wasn't perceived. So the, so that the the, the cost benefits um, and the efficiencies weren't quite as as as, as um, as much as they thought they would be, and you know that it could that a dynamic iterative approach is is much um, more appropriate in terms of skill mix. Not you can't just do a big bang. Nursing, we've seen nursing develop and professionalise significantly over the last thirty years. You know, not without challenge, but you've got now got non medical prescribers. And there's a whole piece of work going on in pharmacy, the, um, you know, reshaping the undergraduate curriculum and the um, training. And, it, and it's moving from a science degree into a, a clinical degree and then the place clinical placements, because those non-medical prescribers are going to be an absolute feature of the workforce. And, and you know, across nursing, pharmacy, PAs, we, we, we have lots of lessons to learn there, I think, in dentistry. We're a little bit behind, we're a little bit lagging because we work a little bit um, without looking at our colleagues and professionalising. But there's a lot of work going on across primary care generally that I think can, can help and, and can contribute really to the journey of, and poor reference into professional education. And I stayed away a little bit from it, um, but I think, I think we've got to get into that space. Primary care, there's huge work going on in primary care, and we have to work with our colleagues in the interest of patients. You know, medical, pharmacy, optom, dental are all primary care providers. We have so much to offer that, that could improve the journey for patients, um, and we're not in that space properly yet. Um, Paul mentioned about the undergraduate, and, I, and I'm really glad he did about actually about hygienist, therapists, nurses, we should be training the whole team together. That's that's fundamental, and it, and it should be happening. And I think the regulator, again, provocative. I think the regulator has to get better at policing that, and not looking at each each aspect in isolation. Um, supporting newly qualified. That's everybody. That's not just ECPs, but sort of supporting all the newly qualified into the workplace. But we do that with foundation training for. Um, dentists in the majority. We don't do anything like that. We have some foundation therapy programmes, but, but we need to get better at doing that. The career pathways and commissioning the education and training, we need to do in collaboration with employers. It's not something any of us can do in isolation. It's a, it's a bigger piece of work in terms of what the offer is. And as I said earlier, the iterative approach um, and taking a stepped approach to it. And then there's a big piece in here and the literature all evidences this. One of the biggest barriers to skill mix in dentistry is that dentists do not understand the roles and they do not, they're not familiar with the roles of, of the DCPs and what they can do and how much work they can, they can share with them and refer to them, etc. Alison and I and, and colleagues did a big piece of research on this. Um, SOSET, because we love acronyms in dentistry, don't we? 
um, skills optimize skills optimize optimize a self evaluation tool. And this is this is a, 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 a tool that we go out to dental practice with and we it's a facilitated tool that we utilize and we go out to dental practice and we work with them with the team to talk about where they are in the skill mix journey and they work as a team to develop where they are in the skill mix journey and then what the action points they can do to improve that skill mix journey it's a fantastic facilitated tool that, that, that we offer in Wales and, and um, we presented at IADR a lot of interest in it so I think this is something that we need to encourage, push and support, but alongside the policy and, and the bigger picture stuff that Jane and Andrew are going to reference as well. That, there we are. Thank you, Alison. Thank you so much, Kirsty. Kirsty, provocative? Surely not. <laughs> You've given us so much to, to, to think about and ponder there, and I'm sure you'll be stimulating questions coming through um, and again, I will say to, to the audience here present, please pop your questions into the Q&A and I'm looking forward to a really rich discussion. Uh, we've had two cracking speakers so far and I would like to move on to our third speaker. If I could invite Jane to um, take up the mantle. Jane, you're on mute at the moment. We can see your slides coming through. Um, you, yeah, that, we can hear you now. Good. The... And can you see me on the slideshow now? Is that yes, fine? that's perfect. Okay. Perfect. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this Insights uh, talk this evening and, and for your very kind introduction. I, I should say, I must have apologised, so I must have sent you an old CV because I've actually been a postgraduate dental dean now since 2013 uh, and not a deputy medical director. So apologies for that. But I'm going to talk to you this evening about um, initiatives that we put in place through COPDEN, through Four Nations and through the HEE Dental Education Reform Programme, lovingly known as DERP, to try and address flexible working skills development and widening access uh, and participation. So it all began several, it seems like an age ago now with the Advancing Dental Care Review, um, which was only published actually in September 21. And the aim of this review um, was to develop an education and training infrastructure for dentistry and oral health that could respond to both the changing needs of patients and service and it, in relation to policy within context in, in England of the NHS long term plan and also local priorities. And it was a very ambitious um, four year plan developed from this, which was the Dental Education Reform Programme. And the strategic drivers for change have been mentioned already. We know we've got changing population needs. We have improvements in adult oral health and in child oral health, but we know we've got pockets of deprivation and high need. We have an aging population um, and we need to put that emphasis on prevention. And as, as the Chief Dental Officer in England commonly reminds us, putting the mouth back in the body. We know that we need to look at funding and supply of the workforce. And as has been mentioned by previous speakers, we have very little data on actual workforce we have the GDC data, but as Kirsty mentioned, we don't know where these people are working, whether they're full time, whether they're even clinical or not, whether they're in the NHS or in private practice. We did have a reduction in England of dental school um, undergraduate placements in 2013 uh, to 14, and that has now come through. And we also ended hygiene therapy bursaries in England in 2015, and we have a big apprenticeship agenda. We also need to look at the skill mix and using the full scope of practice of the workforce, as Kirsty has mentioned. Um, we know that dental therapists are de-skilling because a lot of them are, are, are graduating and working as uh, hygienists, mainly in the private sector. We need to upskill dentists to deliver tier two skills. And we can also develop DCPs with enhanced skills. And I mentioned previously the policy context with the N NHS long term plan, workforce implementation plan, and our advancing dental care report had over 20 actions in it. So the dental education reform objectives, I've listed some of them here. 
and it mainly concentrates on this flexibility of working, skills development, and widening access and participation. We also need to strengthen that interface between pre-registration routes into dental careers and post-registration learning and training. We need to adopt that multi-professional and multidisciplinary approach. And we need to look at the way we train because we know people want more flexible pathways and portfolio working. And we need to make sure that workforce expectations and support for career progression align. And I think the main thing is we also need to look at the importance of alternative pathways to training and prior accredited learning. And the other thing, we need to look at where and where we train. The dental education reform programme we split into four years. Uh, year one, we just completed, that was 21, 22, when we looked at the definition of what we were going to do in the planning. We're currently in year two, moving into year three from 2023 to four, and we're looking at mobilisation and delivery. We're running pilot projects. We're trying to evaluate projects. And in year four, which is 24 to 25, we're, we hope to realise the benefits and embed our uh, education reform into business as usual. So what do we know from the Advancing Dental Care Review, where we undertook um, a lot of stakeholder events, listened to lots of young dentists and undergraduates and um, more experienced people in the profession. We know that geography of posts is really important to applicants if we're looking at um, structured training programmes, foundation, core and specialty. People will, no longer will move just to get a training post. The length of a training programme can make a difference. Historically, our programmes were usually 12 months for dental foundation and then up to three years of 12 months of each of dental core training. So by actually making training programmes linked or having run through type training programmes, it will keep people in posts for longer and it means they don't have to reapply and potentially move geographies. Work-life balance is important to new graduates, and I think it's probably important to a lot more of us now, having lived through COVID. And, you know, less than full-time working is really important. I remember some of the stakeholder events we held, young dentists who and they hadn't actually qualified yet, these dentists, were saying that once they'd paid off their student loans, they intended to go part-time. And they often had other interests, such as artisan baking, that they wished to pursue. So, you know, it's a generational change. We also need to look at the distribution of postgraduate training posts. Historically, a lot of the specialty training posts have been near dental schools. And we know that pe people either want to continue to work where they've trained or go back to where they were brought up and to their families. So we need to build training capacity in areas that have not previously trained. And the other thing is, once we've trained these people, dentists or DCPs, it's no point us upskilling them if they, they, there are no posts or jobs for them to undertake in the NHS. So I'm going to talk now from a very southwest perspective because I know the detail of what's happening in my own region. This doesn't mean that other things aren't happening in other regions, and I will try and highlight that as we go through. But one of the first things that we've done is to identify every general dental practice, NHS practice, within the Southwest and actually look at where we distribute our dental foundation trainees and our dental therapy foundation trainees, which are the blue dots. And actually we have a reasonably good distribution, but what we're looking at is to try and find training posts in those areas where we currently uh, don't have very many trainees. If we look at our distribution in the southwest of our specialty and dental core training posts, on the left here is dental core training, we have a reasonably good geographic distribution. If you see the bigger the dot, the more the trainees. And for core training, the majority, the largest number of our trainees are in Bristol and actually Gloucester. Um, if you look at on the right where we've got specialty training, again, the biggest black dot is right in the middle of Bristol where the dental hospital is. 
and we have very few. I have no specialty trainees currently in Cornwall at all. That will change fairly shortly, though. So one of the things that we were going to do in with the dental education reform program is look at that interface between undergraduate and postgraduate. And, and these are national initiatives that I'm talking about now. Um, so we've worked closely with Dental Schools Council and we've co-developed with them the educational transition document. Now, this has been talked about for years and years, but actually came to fruition with COVID where we had a sort of passport of what undergraduates had done, what they thought about their experience and what the school thought that was passed on from the undergraduate training facility to the dental foundation training practice. And then we've also had feedback to schools from educational supervisors on how helpful and how accurate they thought the um, the, the information provided was, and we're still developing this with Dental Schools Council. It was used, it's been used twice now, and we're just doing our second uh, survey of feedback from educational supervisors. We're also working with stakeholders to improve the Dental Foundation training national recruitment process um, and that transition from undergraduate to Dental Foundation training. Another COPDEND initiative, um, which has been really uh, helpful and fits with, with the, the sort of mood of the Dental Education Reform Programme, is the National Certificate of Dental Core Training Equivalence, which gives an opportunity for dentists who haven't undertaken a, a, a sort of um, standard career progression pathway, a foundation core, and then on into specialty, to actually be able to enter specialty training by showing that their experience and the evidence they've collected through their continuing professional development is equivalent to that who, of someone who's done two years of dental core training. And that started last year with the last specialty training recruitment. It's ongoing this year. And last year, seven individuals who uh, went through and got their national certificate of dental core training equivalents entered specialty training. That doesn't seem a large number, but we do not have large numbers of specialty training trainees each year. That's about nine or 10 percent of the posts, which is really positive. What have we been doing for dental care professionals? Well, we've been working towards a national model in England of delivering therapy foundation training. Uh, currently, each region has their own pilot to therapy foundation training. We've now pulled that together and hopefully we, within the next six months, we should have agreed uh, a national model. Um, it's really unfortunate that although we have um, training places for therapy foundation, very rarely we've never filled all our places in the southwest, although we have on average about 40 dental therapists graduating each year from our two schools. Um, we don't in the southwest, but Thames Valley and Wessex have, have piloted a return to therapy. So we know that most therapists um, well, a lot of them, not all of them, will um, graduate and then work as a hygienist and they de-skill. So what we're hoping to do is be able to give them the confidence to return to their full scope of practice. We're also looking at enhanced skills for therapists and hygienists, particularly potentially linked to special care and paediatrics. Um, and this may lead on to advanced care practitioner status. And we also um, have developed the Oral Health Practitioner Apprenticeship, which has just had its first cohort of dental nurses going through that apprenticeship. And there is a hygiene apprenticeship in the pipeline. So I'm going to go through now some of the DERP initiatives and just explain how we're looking at those in the Southwest and um, or nationally. So we are looking at the distribution of dental foundation training posts uh, nationally because we know that they're looking at population need and making sure we put dental foundation trainees in areas where there is high need and poor access. But of course, we've got to maintain the quality of the training practices. Um, so there's also been a specialty training task and finish groups um, looking at distribution of specialty training for special care paediatrics and oral surgery. 
And certainly in the southwest, we are hoping in the long term that our training numbers will increase. We're looking at developing flexible training models. So I've talked to you about the National Certificate of Dental Core Training Equivalents. We're looking at run through training, particularly for those specialties which have post CCT training in orthodontics and paediatric dentistry, and also offering less than full time training. Um, for you know reasons that you don't not just link to childcare or caring for adults or health reasons, just because people don't want to train full time. We've included childcare as a special circumstance now in national recruitment, which previously wasn't there for specialty training or core training, but was for foundation. And we're looking at having what we're calling early years posts, which are dental foundation, foundation training to DCT one run through posts. Now, some regions have had these what they call longitudinal posts for some years, and they're very attractive posts, very popular posts. And the model that we're going to be using in the southwest is an eight month rotation in a foundation primary care practice in a eight months in a community salaried service in eight months. Uh, in a DCT type post in an OMFS unit. That's our early years model. We've only started in a very small pilot with three trainees, but we're hoping to have at least one early years in every ICB. We have seven of those in the Southwest within the next 24 months. There is difficulty in doing this because we have to build training capacity, particularly in the salaried dental services or community services, and they often have um, issues with chair capacity and nursing capacity as well. But the drivers are that makes the post really popular and improves the uptake of dental core training. We're trying to embed academic opportunities into dental postgraduate training at every stage. And um, as the academic lead for COPDEND, um, I'm really pleased that we now have academic dental foundation training posts in almost every region. We started um, about two years ago with one in the southwest. And last September, there were 20 posts. I'm hoping again we have a similar number this year. And it's shown good progression um, from an academic dental foundation training into um, academic clinical fellow posts at DCT level. Each school in England has an NIHR allocation of ACFs each year and CLs. And the ACFs are available at both DCT and ST level. And this has allowed us to make sure we've embedded those training opportunities, academic training opportunities in every level of training. The other thing we've done is to, as I mentioned before, standardise the dental therapy foundation training across England. There's a national model under, under development and we have a, a Southwest pilot, which is a three day a week training model, um, which allows the therapists uh, to work um, if they want to work privately or within the practices um, for the other two days a week. We're also looking to improve the existing dental foundation training model and develop the interface between pre and post registration. Um, in the Southwest, we've had a particular problem in that we only retain currently about 20% of our undergraduates within the Southwest. So we only have 20% um, of Bristol or Peninsula graduates will do dental foundation training in the Southwest usually. We're trying to encourage more of them to undertake their foundation training in the Southwest by linking in with our, our training programme directors into the undergraduate schools and highlighting some of the opportunities that we have in foundation training that not every region has, such as the community engagement projects that we have. Um, and we're continuing with our careers days for our current dental foundation and core trainees trying to promote the Southwest as a good place to stay and work. Just one more minute, Jane. OK, um, we have um, the apprenticeship programmes, as I've mentioned earlier. We're also exploring concepts of dental, centres for dental development, which can provide hubs um, for both training and patient treatment and hopefully encourage recruitment and retention. And I'll just go on to the last slide, really, which is we're also looking at supporting PLVE dentists. Both nationally, there's work ongoing how we can support dentists, particularly those who haven't practiced for the last two years. And in the Southwest, we've developed a package of financial support, 
and personal support to encourage PLV dentists to come and stay in the southwest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, first off, big apologies for, I don't know what I was thinking, failing to mention your copped end role as postgraduate <laughs> dean, but thank you for thank you for correcting me on that. And it's all my fault, my responsibility. But, <laughs> and, but thank you again for a, a super talk, raising lots more issues for us. And I'm going to move us along now to our last of our four speakers. And I can see Andrew's there ready to roll. So I'll hand over to you, Andrew. Alison, thank you very much and uh, good evening everybody. It's, it is a real pleasure to be sharing this um, stage with my colleagues today. Um, I would like to give um, just a very brief uh, overview around uh, the policy perspective, which should pull together the strands of, of the first three um, talks. Just, just by policy, um, this, this is really a vehicle through which we can drive change um, by making a statement of intent and looking for a means to enact um, that change, which may involve law, regulations or, or protocols. Um, and it was Nelson Mandela that, that first uh, coined the phrase that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And, and obviously healthcare has been th through and is still going through significant change. Um, and we now need to start thinking about how do we start to underpin through policy a way of making this a very sustainable delivery. So I, I always come back to the, to, to, to the concept of um, where are we at now with dentistry um, and, and where is modern dentistry? Because we have been undergoing that change. And um, one can argue we've been going through change probably for 30 years. Um, and therefore, it's not as rapid as we as we would expect. Uh, dentistry really these days is a mindset. It's not just doing something to patients. It's it's adopting the team approach, which Kirsty was talking about. It's using modern te techniques that, that Paul um, uh, very clearly showed uh, that the undergraduates are learning. And as Jane said, it's the modern dentist is now going to be, an, I call them an orofacial specialist with a healthcare focus. So dentistry is very much an evolution. I have to keep saying that um, we've been probably on this path for a long time. And it was the Steele report 13 years ago, which started saying that we need a whole team ethos. We need to encourage skill mix and we need to drive prevention. Um, as Kirsty alluded, it was the Nuffield report in 1993, which first brought in the term DCP, which I think doesn't give a very clear description of the skills that the whole team can bring um, into dentistry. And then just to be provocative, I think as we are advancing the, the techniques that we have available in dentistry, um, we need to be asking dentists to do the things that only dentists can do and allow the rest of the team to support in the way that we deliver that service. And I fully, un I fully appreciate that this involves funding, time, policy, and education. So I think it's a very good opportunity that we've reached in this immediate post-COVID world that we can have that, that conversation this evening. So why is it important? Well, society is changing uh, around us as well. Um, and as we've already um, alluded, um, we're an aging uh, population. We've got a, a big change in our demographics. We're expanding um, as, as a nation. And we and we're dealing with economic uncertainty but i think out of all of this list the thing that is probably going to drive the greatest change is going to be the health inequalities that have become magnified over the last couple of couple of years and, and i like this this diagram just to illustrate um in the now where we have been for a long time we tend to sort of go round and round we make marginal changes we we tinker around the edges and I think we've reached a point now, we need to move into a next generation for dentistry, and that's going to require a right shift in, in our mindset. And that is going to be a big challenge to everybody. We talk about, about reform, but that reform can only come if we actually want to do this um, as, as a whole team. And when we talk about inequalities, we've been talking about this and aware of this for a very long time. And I've just mapped out some of the, some of the major landmark 
um, pieces of policy that came out that we have been trying to work with for, for the best part of, of nearly 50 years now. And I've put into that the Steele report, which was talking about a whole system reform based on, on a needs and a risk-based preventative approach. And I think we've we've really got to, 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 to now start to enact this as we move forward. Um, and while COVID has been a very good signpost for us, it is not the it is not the main reason why we're having these conversations. But I think it's a useful frame. Um, we've looked at the impact of COVID through some independent reports through the GDC, and I've pulled out sort of five main pieces of learning which I, I think we should um, should really be considering. The first was, in in order to get through. Um, COVID, we had to take a moral over an evidence-based decision. Um, in, in England, for example, dental practices closed for 10 weeks. That was a moral decision to keep everybody safe. It showed that we, as a professional group, we were sticking to our, our, our stand, professional and moral standards. From my perspective, it showed that um, the way that we currently run our dental services through an activity-based contract doesn't work because suddenly that started to destabilize the entire NHS business of dentistry because the practices were not seeing the volume of patients which was um, required in order to maintain the financial flow through the practices. So as we move forward, we've got to think of another way of, of, of funding dental, um, dental services. Um, we heard about technology and, and we moved uh, very rapidly to, to adopting new ways of, of working. Um, and uh, as Paul was saying, the undergraduates don't like um, moving online, but, but we learned so much um, that we've got to be thinking about how we can still maintain some of, some of those opportunities as we move forward. But, but I think the, the key learning was prevention is absolutely vital. Um, the, the, the level of unmet need that generated um, through um, the, the disturbances of the last two and a half years have shown that those who have a prevention um, driven ethos um, actually managed to cope very well with that, with, with that period of disruption. And of course, we need to be underpinning this with research. Um, there are other things that we learned. We, 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 we went through redeployment. We, we were very quick to change policy to get people to work differently. Um, we accelerated people through programs. We put staff into, into very different environments. And we did all of that with changes of legislation and the law in, in, in a really fast and agile manner. Um, and we don't really want to be losing that. Um, we did exactly the same with technology. And again, in education, um, with the, the emphasis in education partic particularly swung towards generating high evidence and quality education that allowed people to move into those new areas. People started to adapt e-learning, which, be, which be pre um, between pre-1920 um, was something which people didn't really want to engage in. And now a lot of people are actually using technology um, for, as part of their education. Um, we saw more people moving to quality improvement um, uh, during that period, which was incredibly encouraging to see. So this has led to a behavioural change. And when I talk about research, I think we are now in, a, in, in the most strong position to appreciate um, the impact of the oral microbiome on our general health. And certainly that adage that Jane mentioned about putting, putting the mouth back into the body is absolutely vital. As this is an educational um, meeting, I've, I went back to the uh, to the principles and purposes of education, um, and uh, these were the fine, five main criteria which which a lot of people talk about. Not just uh, only the, that education is important to keep a country moving and get economic success, but it's about cultivating a skilled work, work, workforce that is able to cope in in that environment, which means increasing literacy and also instilling critical thinking. Um, and this is um, something which I shine back towards um, undergraduate and postgraduate of how do we teach people to critically think? Um, there is literature out there. It doesn't get the airplay, which I think it deserves. Um, and I think that is also part of understanding our culture. So I took that and, and thought, well, what are the challenges as, as I perceive it? And I think, We've got an increasing pressure to try and solve tomorrow's problems today. 
um, and everything is moving in the here and now. So we, we've we've got to keep thinking, what are the wins that we can do? What are the things that we need to be adapting as we go forward? What 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 do we need to equip the future workforce? As, as Jane was saying, already that's adapting. We're, we're thinking differently about how we are going to train. But where should that happen? So I always ask where, what and how should that learning happen? Does it have to happen in a teaching hospital or can it, can it work out where the patients um, actually need our services? And I think this requires us to think very intuitively with a holistic approach. And therefore, what we're really wanting to try and achieve in this here and now is let's try and build a firm foundation on what is a shifting landscape. Um, and I pulled out a very old diagram of how training used to work and Jane has just blown that out of the water by looking at, at the way that we are going to be delivering postgraduate education in the future. We're going to have to contract differently. That's going to take uh, changes in legislation and NHS regulations to allow us to think differently. We've heard that our young graduates um, and early uh, careers practitioners are looking differently. They want an expansion of posts. A lot of those are, have a training element, but they're not within a formal rigid training pathway. And that we've got to start looking at that um, team delivery where everybody is working to the top of their license. A very Americanism, but I think it's becoming more and more important. The Jimmy Steele care not cure model, I think is absolutely vital. And, and my challenge is how do we get that emphasized within undergraduate programs because career opportunities are widening and people are going to want to be working differently and also our patients are going to want us to work differently. So um, I, I worked with, with Jane and Kirsty in the past um, where we've been looking at what um, trainees um, are asking for and, and this is really a summary of Jane's slide um, but they're looking for new challenges, they're looking for working differently, training differently but um, nuanced around their geographic commitments. We've got to start thinking, how do we get people to work in a different way, in a different place? How are we going to serve our rural and isolated communities? How are we going to work with our um, inner city areas which have significant inequalities? Um, and it's about building a, a pathway for people that they can actually start working in that environment. So this is probably my, my key slide is starting to look at the problems and the opportunities. Let's moving from the past, moving into the future. And if we were really critical about the past, we've had a very siloed approach to dentistry. We haven't really been um, making oral health everybody's business. We've been making it a, a dental business. Um, a, a lot of the policy that we've had in the past have been very short term orientated with the organisation uh, you know, a building or a, or, or a health system at its centre. We're actually moving forward. We need to be much more ambitious. We need those integrated programmes that Paul was mentioning. They've got to have much longer goals. We've got to be able to see what the, the, the benefits of these changes that we're driving. But equally, workforce has got to be at the centre. So therefore, in order to make those changes, we can't just tinker around the edges. We need a contract reform, we need a whole system reform and underpinned by an education reform. And I think we've heard tonight that that's actually in progress um, across the UK, which is really quite exciting. So just my, my final point is we've got to be supporting that workforce if we're going to be asking them to work and train differently. Um, and I think the learning from COVID is we had a very vulnerable workforce leading into um, 2020. Um, and we've got to start looking after the workforce because um, that Richard Branson uh, model of if you look after your workforce, they'll look after your clients, I think ha has never been more important. Um, and we've already heard from Kirsty and, and Jane about different ways of working. And I think an integrated model is so vital moving forward to give people the opportunity to work where they, where they really can use their skill set to the maximum advantage. That's going to take a system innovation um, and we've always been very task orientated. Everything has been around targets, waiting lists um, and we had to get rid of that during COVID. We moved into this adaptive way of working which was very flexible and agile and we became very problem sol solving. Um, I'm worried that we're going back to that task orientated um, uh, method uh, and we've got to sort of keep moving that forward. 
and, and I'm proposing really we need to be more contextual, that we've got to think about our population base. What do they need? How do we assess their risk and their needs? How do we train the future generation to be able to think more preventatively and actually see that as being an important part of their role, not just doing things to people, but, but working with, with their patients. So personalizing the care um, that they're giving and utilizing everything else that we've learned, the digital solutions, the skill mix. Um, and all of this, I'm, I strongly believe if we work with our workforce around their well-being, giving back the autonomy to look after the patients will start to help us in terms of retention of that workforce. So my challenge um, to everybody, Alison, is if I gave you a blank page and said, how would we imagine the dental workforce looking in the future? I've started off putting in what my wish list would be um, if we were going to start trying to develop that, uh, that, that future workforce. But this is in our hands. We can do this, um, but we need to do it as a whole system. We need to do it together. But my, my final point, which I'll leave you with, Alison, is if we are going to be educating this future workforce, we've got to do it very differently. And, and what I listen to from many years of be working in education is a lot of people saying, I will undergo this behavior change if you can convince me why it needs to be done. And I think of it in terms of what we do in, uh, as a role model for that future generation. I'm inspired by something which I'm just starting to learn about, which is the hidden curriculum about um, if you are modeling and, and people want to follow what your, what your leadership is, I think we need to be very introspective and, and, and critical of what we are actually doing. Then we, we need to make a compelling story. I, I think narrative is so important in, in, the young gen, in the younger careers generation. So they actually understand why they're doing it. Then we need to reinforce it so that they can actually see that what we're talking about is actually working. But on top of that, we then need to give them the skills required to change. And that's not just technical skills, that's leadership, that's management, um, and it's giving them the opportunity to try and to fail, put them in a secure environment in order to do that. And again, this is where we have to start thinking about policy and working with the regulators. So I think if I was talking about the future of dental education from a policy perspective, I think I'd want to be looking at it by giving back autonomy, looking at creating an environment where they belong and where they can contribute and to continue to develop their, their competence as practitioners, um, but to also be able to lead that team. So Alison, I'm gonna stop there and hand back to you, thanks. Thank you so much, Andrew. Very thought provoking. As we were going to move into a very short break um, and then pick up uh, the panel discussion, but I just want to say a couple of things and how impressed I've been with our speakers' candidness We've not heard, oh, isn't dental education wonderful? We have in some senses, but people have been very um, candid, thought provoking and saying, recognizing that it's a very complex shifting landscape and things need to change. And so I'm just going to look forward to um, hearing further discussion as we come back from the break. It And just while we're waiting, it struck me that um, we had a, a, a quote from Mother Teresa and from <laughs> Nelson Mandela. I wonder if that says something about uh, dental education. Uh, Richard Branson as well, I believe. Yes, indeed. Richard Branson got in there too. Thank you for popping in more questions. I don't coming through now, that's great. Okay, we're always restricted for time and it's uh, 5.30 now. So I'm going to kick off and have a look at the, the first question starting at the top. And this is a question about how we ensure dental foundation training keeps pace with the changes that are happening at undergraduates. So it's something about the um, continuum of education and training. 
Who might like to kick off with a comment there? Jane? Well, I'm happy to um, um, see that. I think the educational transition document has been very important in that. And it's it's really building that link with undergraduate schools. Um, and obviously the ones that it's easier to build a relationship with your local school, with your foundation trainers and um, uh, and, and the sort of associate deans and training program directors. But we are also looking at the um, the, the COP DEND um, Dental Foundation Training Advisory Group. We'll be looking at the uh, continually looks at the curriculum and the requirements for training. But remember these are safe beginners so they, they should have had their basic undergraduate training. It's really about supporting them moving into more independent practice in foundation training. But we are finding that because of, the, of COVID and the impact on clinical experience in undergraduate schools, they may have the capabilities, but they, they are lacking more in confidence. So they are needing a bit more support when they come into um, to foundation training, uh, certainly in the very early stages. So we we do have a, a very good induction in, in all regions. And part of the GDC requirements for graduation during COVID was that we had uh, clinical skills sessions for them as soon as they came into foundation training. And actually one of the things that COVID has caused is because we've had delayed graduation, they haven't had a two or three months, or even some of them haven't practiced dentistry since, you know, the Easter, end of the Easter term until September. Now, <clears throat> the gap between them practicing and actually coming into foundation training is much shorter. Thank you, Jane. Would anybody else like to make a comment? Paul, would you like to make a comment there? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane. That's um, really interesting to hear. And I, I think from um, uh, from an undergraduate point of view, uh, I, I think the perfect scenario would be a two way street here. So we, we often are mindful of feedback from postgraduate training from DF trainers and above about um, status of our, uh, our former undergraduates. Uh, um, but I, it, I think some sort of a forum where we can um, we can feedback about what we're what we are teaching our, uh, ourselves and what are our issues uh, would, would be very beneficial. Um, it's really fantastic here at Cardiff and at most dental schools we have DCTs here um, doing their own training program, but they quite quite often teach uh, or help teaching the undergraduate program as well, and that's really really amazing to see because students love the undergrads love it, the DCTs love it. It gives them a, a real passion for education passion for dentistry um and it gives a, a, a different perspective so um sort of joint training with different levels of um normal training program can be uh, really beneficial as well thanks paul there's something certainly there about um communication and expectations and it being a two-way street between the different um stages and levels within the education process. I'm going to move us along and skip us along quite quickly through some of the questions so we can get as many of them as we can to have a fair airing. The next one maybe for Kirsty is the first, re first response, which is about um, how we support the DCP group of dental nurses, which is by far the biggest group. Um, do you want to add some comments there? So I will try and be brief, but there's a whole host of issues in, in there. So I'll, I will list the, what I think we need to do. And I'm quite clear about this. I think Andrew referenced belonging. And, and I think that's fundamental and really important. There's a value issue here. Dental nurses haven't been valued terribly well. The pandemic exposed that. There was already problems. Um, many discovered they had transferable skill sets and were offered different roles and redeployed and they never came back. Huge issues. Um, so that we've got to get the contractors, the employers, valuing the dental nurses. That's improving. Market forces um, are dictating that that you know when you when you have an absence of a workforce, it exposes really the challenges um, and how valuable they actually are. So that's improving. But we, there are some fundamental issues in terms of the training routes to registration. They are there's mixed routes. Mixed availability um, of provision of training, the regulation of that is challenging. So there's some real challenges in there. Some of the training routes aren't on the qualifications framework, so can't attract apprenticeship funding. The apprenticeship funding in itself is a challenge because employers just want to pay for the cheapest labour they can. And then it's so historically it's been quite a fluid workforce because of the value. I think value is fundamental. The corporate, and, and this has been 
referenced somewhere else in the questions, the corporates are identifying some of these challenges and offering incentives, but that's based on the income that can be generated privately. So that mixed economy is really challenging. Um, for the NHS particularly, um, we can work with the policymakers and the governments to, de to determine that workforce is valued and incentivised better within the NHS, but that, that's something that I think we have to develop. Um, the NHS pension is a real challenge because they're employed by the independent contractors, not by the NHS directly. So, there's some, so, so this is what the point about corporates. Independent contractors, employers can offer it, offer the incentives it's to, for them to determine. And some of the corporates have cottoned onto that and are making the offers. NHS doesn't have the availability of tools, um, incentives to offer. And that's something we've got to build in. And Andrew's nodding, I can see. So we're trying, you know, we're working with the policymakers and, and to try and develop that and build in that workforce offer to grow them. Career pathways, we've, we've, we've got to work with the employers. It's not within our gift as, as a workforce body or, or, or it's not, you know, this is a collaborative approach that we need to do, but you're absolutely right. We need to give them the professional identity entity and the voice because they've not had that to date that's that's a very very quick um answer thank you thank you for that Kirsty. and i and i might bring andrew in here to comment on a on a kind of a linked question um which is about how we are involving big employers such as the corporates and how do you factor in the profit driver within practices into things that are being proposed yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, this this is where contract reform comes in, um, and and I think what uh, for for those old enough like I am to remember the the, pre the previous forms of the dental contract in 1990 and and 2006, we've really sort of played around the, the the edges. We haven't thought about all of the complexity of delivering a contracted healthcare service, which ultimately does have to have a business element um, to it um, because they are employing staff. They've got to maintain um, the, 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 that stability to, to, to the business model. And I, I think what the um, what the corporate organisations um, are, and I'm talking for Wales now, um, really help us is that they tend to take up contracts in very hard to reach areas so in in the rural areas and some of the some of the the areas of multiple deprivation um, and therefore a contract which is delivering against the needs of that population which tends to be relatively high need dental disease um, is is nuancing a contract which is what we're doing currently in Wales will uh, will give them that financial stability to look after those patients. At the current time, there isn't any profit to be made in dealing with people who are very high needs. You make your profit from um, seeing lots of low needs patients. Um, and that's very, very different from the GP model that we see in, see in medicine. So that's where a contractual change has got to favour the patients, but they've also got to favour the, um, the business as well. Jane, is that something you'd like to add to? You're on mute at the moment. I don't yes. think I really can add anything more to and what Andrew said, really. <laughs> that's that's OK. That's fine. I'm going to move us on to another question, which is uh, from a different perspective. And that's uh, I don't know whether anybody's got a comment on where we're at with the draft dental foundation, dental therapist foundation training curriculum. It was drafted back in 2014-15. Uh, is that being used now? Do we know? It, it, it's still, be, as far as I know, it's still being used um, because we haven't. But but obviously, when we review the foundation training one, that will come. At, we will be looking at that as well. So so yes, I, I think yes, it's being used in Wales. Mm. Um, I think the point is, is 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 it being used to standardise the yeah. offer across England as part of DERP? Mm. I think that's the question that's being asked. Yeah. Well, when, just... We're not we're not really looking at standardisation of the curriculum because we've been using that draft curriculum. What we're looking at standardising the model because currently we're all paying different things, or it's some some regions are doing it for three days, some are doing it for five days. So we, we, what we're doing is a standardised model and a standardised funding of that of that model across HEE. This, this Alison, I'm going to because I think it's come up one of the one of the other questions has come up about the NHS pension as, as yes. it's resurfaced a little bit. So I'm just going to tackle this. Doctors and dentists are paid on a medical and dental pay scale. 
the rest of the healthcare profession isn't this non-medical so there's some real funding challenges in there and that's tied into the pension and how they're paid and so skill mix is a great concept but we can if we can get therapists to do a lot of the work we can't necessarily offer them the same incentives and superannuation the doctors and dentists get because they're not paid on the same pay scale and jane's just alluded to the pay an agenda for change is a real challenge in the NHS, I think, for, for non-medical and dental. We've got therapists who are on a band six, we've got therapists who are on a band seven. There's a real um, challenges across the system in terms of what the pay is and what the conditions are. Um, so that that kind of is, is the, the, the basis of why the NHS pension is not readily available. And do we, if that's the challenge, what's the way forward? Any thoughts on that? It's it's a big one. It's the reason the nurses are striking um, and the ambulance. It's it's the it's the fundamental. And I don't think any, I, I you know I'm, I don't want to get too far into this space. But it, it's the agenda for change is is, is a um, a challenge for the NHS because it ties non medical and dental into those pay scales if they're employed in the NHS. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to move us along to uh, another question here that we have, which is with Mandela in mind and celebrating the importance of education. Why do you think dentistry invests, invests so little in education itself? Any Can I pick that up, Alison? Yeah, please do. Um, because I mean, that's a, a, a brilliant question and it's multifaceted in my, in, in my mind. Um, and, and so just a few sort of outline thoughts. The first is, um, why aren't we offering paid CPD like like is a, uh, that's available in in, in medicine? I'm, I wonder whether that's part of this question, and that's back to the point Kirsty made around the the employed and self-employed status um, of of practitioners. To my mind, and something that I'm um, uh, agitating for um, uh, uh, is that dentistry isn't um, regulated the same as. Uh, medicine. We don't have revalidation. We don't even have a, have um, robust appraisal. Um, and I think they, they're very good drivers for maintaining um, standards and maintaining um, CPD and continual development. Um, so it's not just about in direct investment um, into, um, in, in, into individuals. I think there is investment in dentistry in terms of education at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Um, uh, people probably don't fully understand how expensive um, the foundation um, program is compared to the medical foundation program, for example. Um, so a there is a large investment into the into the early careers aspect of of dentistry, but it's that um, uh, retention of the self-employed dentist model and the employed. Um, dental nurse model, which I think starts to conflict. If we moved into that salaried model that Kirsty was starting to talk about and the agenda for change, that would have to be part of the negotiated package of putting in funded funded CPD. But at the current time, it's it's not something that many people have an appetite to move towards. Mm. Mm. Interesting thoughts there. Any other comments from the panel members, other panel members? I, I think Andrew's, Andrew's articulated it well. I think some regulatory challenges. We know the GDC has the most dated legislation of all of the professional regulators, um, which, which I don't think helps. I think some of the things that have been exposed is also that dentistry has operated in a silo quite comfortably for a number of years. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we need to look across the sectors and learn from, from our colleagues. I, I don't know that dentistry does invest so little in education. I think Andrew's right. I think there is a fair sizable investment goes on into the workforce and the spotlight on us at the moment will, will only um, improve that position. I think it's about getting a collective voice and about everybody being in the same place. And I'm not sure that we're in that place just yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Kirsty. Moving on to another question here, which I'll read out. And this is asking, to what extent do you agree with the GDC's rationale for including the following areas of content for the safe practitioner framework? And the specific one that's uh, identified there is managing mental health and well-being. So what, what are the panel's thoughts on that? Perhaps I might invite Paul to come in there. What's... Uh, I, I, I don't know if I can offer too much guidance on that. <laughs> Perhaps someone else from a panel. 
I, I'm, I'm happy to say, I mean, we haven't done a COP Gen response yet to the um, GDC consultation. Actually, Kirst is going to be collating our response. But I, I think it's every, I, I think undergraduates before they graduate need to be able to understand and manage their mental health and well-being um, in order to protect patients. So I see it as a patient safety issue, because if you're not mentally well yourself and um, well, you can't manage your patients appropriately. So, so you know, I think it's probably a reasonable thing to put in. And I think you know, it is sort of the, the buzzwords of the of this sort of year, isn't it? Mental health and well-being. And, but it is very important to everyone. And I think it's come to light much more with COVID. Yes, sorry, for, Paul, for putting you on the spot there, but it was something that you, I, I think you, you you mentioned well-being. I think in one of your one of your slides. Um, can, can I come in on yeah, that, please Alison? Do. So I'm going to be really controversial now. That there is a lot of research out there um, about how uh, what what are the factors that that impact and how on on the well-being of our workforce. Um, one is the immense volume of work that is currently going through, but that predated COVID. COVID is just magnified it, but it predated it. Secondly, patients, um, they are very demanding. There is a very strong um, litigation culture within dental patients. Um, and uh, the third is regulatory. Um, and so it's interesting that the GDC are asking it. I think it's appropriate that, that it's being asked, but uh, but. I, I think it's something that we've all probably heard before. It's not about making our workforce more resilient. It's the system that shouldn't be asking them to become more resilient. The system should be looking to change. Um, and therefore, um, there are um, ways and, 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 and tools available to support people who do have issues with um, uh, with their well-being and mental health and, and that is available widely through the NHS. A lot of charities including the trades unions, some of the colleges all put together these uh, these resources and, and self-help um, uh, uh, and funded organisations through the NHS um, but, but at the same time I think we need to really have a strong look at what is it that's impacting on people's well-being and where can we make those changes. So looking at the causes rather than trying to looking at the factors so, yeah. behind behind it mm -hmm. and then there's a question more generally about the panel's view on the consultation that the gdc has so jane jane's going to throw that to me i think um <laughs> so so we're doing a fair bit of work jane's right and she's referenced it i think from a cop end perspective education training transition document we've done uh, collected a lot of data and i think the i will also say and i don't think jane was um the relationship between COP and dental schools council is, is absolutely one of the benefits of COVID is that has improved measurably. Um, and, and I think that 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 working together, um, I think the 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 the, um, the 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 consultation, I think, is interesting. I don't I think that I've heard a lot of colleagues say that the term safe, um, safe beginner is they have antibodies because you can do nothing to be safe. And so, the, so there are some real challenges in there, but I come back to the, the challenge the GDC has, which is how limiting their legislation is in their reach in this space. The GMC is, has a much wider reach a, a, across undergraduate, postgraduate education than the GDC. And that's a real challenge for the regulator. And I think getting that understood is, is, is challenging in the, within the profession itself. Um, I, I, I think it's timely. I think it presents us with an opportunity to push back on the GDC. I think there are some challenges that they are now consulting on the learning outcomes and then following that they'll consult on how institutions are inspected. It would be better if they were coming at the same time because there's, you know, they're, they're inextricably linked. So there's some real challenges in there. I think it's timely though, and I, and I do welcome it. But I think the bigger issue is how the profession works together collectively. Okay, thank you there, Kirsty. Um, moving on to a question here. There was a comment about working within policy. Is there an appetite to disaggregate policy and perhaps help influencers rethink? I don't know whether anybody, Andrew, do you want to pick that one up? Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure well, I, how much I can give an answer to that. But policy, as I said at the beginning, is this thing that pulls all the strands together that that makes something happen which is sustainable uh, otherwise um it becomes a pilot or um you know a little project um i think um to disaggregate from policy 
um, then it would you'd be disaggregating it from the thing that we need most, which is money. Um, and, and I think without policy, there would be no funding for for, for services. So um, I, I certainly think there is a huge um, uh, need to to be innovative um, and disruptive um, in the, in this current uh, climate. Um, but there are certain things that we keep falling back on, and and within healthcare, the first thing you ever hear about is is there any more money? Um, and I think therefore policy can help um, to, to reshape that. But if you divorce the two, I just don't think you get anything which is long-term sustainable. Plus a personal view. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Kirsty, did you- I, have... I would, no, I would agree with that. I don't think you can disaggregate them. I think dentistry operates on drivers and it complains about how, how over-regulated and how, how task oriented it is but it still depends on the drivers to do that and I, and I think Andrew's right it, the influencers you know enough field the reports we've talked about the, 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 the think tanks that recommend the changes but they won't happen without the policy drivers behind them so I, I do think there's there is something in there you cannot disaggregate them completely okay I'm going to move around in some of the questions to give an airing to questions being raised by um people are so fresh people so some of the questions have been raised by uh, a number of the questions have been raised by individuals so this is a this is from a different person asking is there any evidence to suggest that new dental undergraduates are actually any better prepared for practice Paul is that one you might like to comment on it's, it's it's very difficult because we, we we wave goodbye to them and then uh, <laughs> they're released into the big wide world but um in, in terms of uh, sort of anecdotal evidence um, from uh, the wider dental community, you know, there is a general feeling that undergraduates are worse prepared, um, generally speaking, um, uh, in, 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 in terms of uh, many areas of dentistry related to the reduced kind of experience that they're getting. Um, although in some areas, they're going to be better prepared. Uh, some of the more modern areas of dentistry um, uh, and so this is something that um, really is is part of this joint effort with undergraduate postgraduate training um, to um, to really sort of move move um, dentists uh, dental staff through this through this journey. Um, I hope they're better prepared for practice. I hope I can uh, <laughs> I can lead them towards that. Um, uh, time will tell, I guess. It's a really complex concept, that idea of preparedness for practice, and it is such a, uh, uh, there's so many different aspects to it. I think, Paul, you're right to pick up on, you know, there may be, there may be a, a sense of being better prepared in some areas, but um, possibly we're not sure about all of those areas. And as you say, you release them to some extent out into that world and it's about that feedback I think if I, as well. If I can add just uh, just one more thing. Um, it, it's historically sort of undergraduate dental education has been led by specialists um, in in the various fields of dentistry. I'm a general dental practitioner and I'm really passionate about the skills of dental 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 I can't say the word practitioner a GDP um, and inspiring students to become GDPs themselves and I think that's that's kind of an underrepresented area in dental education. Um, with the College of General Dentistry, we're seeing new pathways for specialism within generalization. Um, and that's something that I'd like to inspire my undergraduates to, to, to move towards. It's all part of the hidden curriculum and the role modeling. Um, mm. I'm going to move along to another question that we have here is uh, recently the term the great resignation has appeared in the language of commercial and corporate business businesses. Does the panel feel that the future workforce may be affected to the same extent? Can I Perhaps, Andrew, answer? yes, please do. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, this, this is obviously um, uh, being played out in, in, in social media and in a lot of the discussions about the fact that um, particularly the younger um, career uh, dentists are um, thinking about either leaving the NHS practice and moving into the private sphere or actually leaving dentistry altogether and looking at other career op opportunities. Um, and it's something that I take very seriously when, when we hear this and, and try to find out what, what it is that are their 
are there particular drivers for that for that change? Um, and I think this is why um, each of the four nations are currently looking at, at the way that they um, uh, commission dentistry and uh, and they um, contract with with the younger professions. To, so having a contract reform as well as the system reform, I think is going to be very important if we want to to retain that that workforce into the future. And, and one of the things that I um, regularly talk to um, the, the younger generation about is from leaving dental school to when they're theoretically going to be able to pull their pension is about 45 years of, of this career. How do they keep themselves in top-notch condition um, and enthusiastic about their profession for that length of time? Uh, and I think this is where it, it probably what the little bit I know about corporate business is that people have been looking for new fields to move into. Um, dentistry is relatively restrictive unless you move out into industry or into the into academia research. Um, and so therefore we've got to do something within um, the, the profession to to give them that that uh, will reinvigorate that enthusiasm that I'm sure they had when they went into um, into the undergraduate program and maintain that um, for that early part of their career. Um, and the same at the other end of the career when when people are thinking of early retirement, um, you know, are there things that we can do that may give them a, a different a different way of, of working? So I think it, it, it's it's all around looking at the at the system reform, the contract reform, um, and and trying to understand why people may wish to leave the profession. I think Andrew, you've in part addressed another question here, but I will put it out to the panel in case somebody else might like to contribute it and. This is saying the panel has touched on the erosion of well-being and job satisfaction within the profession. Can this be improved through education? Would somebody like to come in there? Well, well I can come in, in there. Thank I you, think, Jane. I think, I think it can be improved through education um, and training because I think education and training can offer different opportunities to individuals. And I think, um, I mean, we know a lot of general dental practitioners will go and do sessional se sessions at dental schools and they don't do it because of the money they receive. They do it because it's an opportunity to network and be with other people and to give something back to the profession. And also it makes a, a variety to the working week. And I think from talking to young dentists, I think they see opportunities to work part-time in, in in clinically but to take on other roles such as you know and there will be increasing roles with ICBs with um, in England in managed clinical networks um, in education and also in commissioning of, of dentistry so I, I see without education and training people can't progress to those roles and I think one of the things from the dental education reform program, those areas that don't have a dental school, they don't have a hub. And that's what we were hoping the Centres for Dental Development would give an opportunity for networking, for development, for peer support. Um, and that that sort of because it can be quite a lonely existence being a general dental practitioner because it's just you and your dental nurse with the patient who can't really communicate that much when they've got their mouth open most of the day. So I, I see it as a real opportunity. Can I come in at that? I'll just come in if I may, Alison. I, I, I'd just like to draw us back to Andrew's comment about the hidden curriculum, because education doesn't need to be formal. And if we talk about the team and modelling behaviours and leadership, et cetera, et cetera, that is so fundamentally important. And Paul's just made the point about being a GDP and being able to influence the upcoming undergrads. And I think it's, it's behest upon all of us to do that and, and make sure that we, we evidence and, and grow that through the profession, that hidden curriculum is so, so important. I think that's an excellent point to finish on. I'm very aware of the time and I know that Jackie wants to make one or two brief concluding remarks. But for me, I'm going to say thank you so much to the panel. Really, really enjoyed all your contributions. So thank you. Thank you. So if I could just um, step in to close and um, I agree, Alison, the hidden curriculum is a brilliant place to uh, end on. And it does seem to me in a lifetime of education that we can 
do the formal teaching that we want, but if we get the hidden curriculum um, pulling us in a different direction, we will never achieve change. So um, well done for, for highlighting it this evening and um, let's all work on it together. So um, just as we wind up, uh, thank you ever so much, Alison. What brilliant chairmanship. Uh, and thank you to the panel, to Paul, Kirsty, Jane and Andrew. Uh, terrific insights, uh, really helpful. Um, and I think everybody has had a, a really good evening. The, the quality of the questions coming in from the audience were excellent uh, and clearly maintained focus on what you were saying. So um, just finally to remind people that we are here. Um, this is about dental education. Uh, we are about dental education and um, not just dentists, dental. Uh, and so we are here and we tomorrow will 